and I welcome you here. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I welcome you here to Goodwood, uh, our hosts, who are very gracious to allow us to be here. Well, the Martin House has been closed, but I think we all decide we really like your Goodwood. <laughs> it's a real good fit for all of us. And uh, we've been real involved here um, doing uh, some archeology span out here as well. Uh, but anyway, so we are the Panhandle Archeological Society at Tallahassee. And uh, we'd love to have you as a member. If you're not already, you can go to our website. It's very reasonably priced. It's only $20 for individuals, $25 for families, and only, Bonnie, do you remember $10 for students? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's very, very reasonable. Uh, and that helps us pay for this uh, and the, the different things that PASS does and to bring you snacks each month, which reminds me, Thank you so much to those of you who bring snacks every month and grail those pizzas. They're always a huge hit. Everybody loves them. We really appreciate it. Yeah, Lonnie does. Lonnie loves pizza. Um, so we have uh, next month is going to be, I believe we're going to try and do in person, but our speaker will be virtual. Uh, and Guy and I are going to be out of town. We're going to do our best to get back for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and um June's still a little up in the air. We need to talk about that. So without further ado, our speaker tonight is Amy Socha. She is the currently the newest member of the BAR, my family, my bureau, uh, underwater section. And she is a recent graduate of Florida State University's anthropology department. And she was one of Jesse Halligan's students who a lot of you know and saw Jesse's uh, hacked presentation, which that's not gonna happen now because we made things to correct that. But um, so before uh, January, I did a little snooping on Amy and she is a competitive swimmer, like serious competitive swimmer. And that I'm guessing that's maybe how you got interested in underwater. Yeah, yeah. So uh, she's originally from Indiana, got her BA at Tufts University. And as I mentioned, her master's at FSU under Jesse. And she did her master's work uh, on the Osceola River which um, it, uh, under, uh, well, it was, it was under a permit, a 2032 permit, which is administered by, also by the Bureau. So we're gonna hold her to very high standards for when that stuff gets turned in to collections. So um, anyway, without further ado, Amy Socha. Hi everyone, thank you, Marie, for that fabulous introduction. Um, Today, I'm gonna to be talking about sediment analysis in underwater archeology. span I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I did in my master's thesis, um, like I said, at, in the Osceola River. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about a second project that I worked on with BAR, also involving sediment boring. So I can... Just a little, little sensitive right now. There we go. Well, I can skip over a lot of this slide since we just went over it, but I was going to introduce myself a little bit. Like Marie said, I'm the uh, current senior archaeologist in the underwater program uh, at the Bureau of Archaeological Research. Um, graduated from Tufts University, where I studied archaeology and geoscience. So um, in the underwater program, everybody deals with all aspects of underwater archaeology from shipwreck to submerged landscapes and pre-contact. But my specialty is geoarchaeology and pre-contact landscapes. And so from my undergrad, that's kind of where I began to merge those interests um, or maybe develop those interests. I focus primarily on Mesoamerican archaeology and quaternary geology. Um, and eventually when I started looking at graduate programs, like Marie said, I found Dr. Halligan's work at FSU and absolutely jumped at the opportunity to learn to do uh, archaeology underwater. I learned to scuba dive through FSU. I'd been a swimmer, but never a diver. Um, and have since become a scuba instructor. So 
to move into the topic of the presentation, like the title kind of indicated, I'm going to be talking about coring. Um, so geoarc and underwater archaeology are both really broad fields with a lot of methods and topics. Um, a sediment coring kind of is my focus. That's been the thing that I've analyzed the most in my time as an archaeologist. Um, and I kind of see it as one of the fundamental units of geoarchaeological analysis. Um, they can collect and preserve strata while being minimally invasive to a site. Um, kind of the underwater equivalent of a test pit where excavating is really, really expensive and time consuming underwater. There are a lot of additional moving parts, but taking a core is kind of a simpler and smaller, uh, smaller scale operation that can give you some of the same results. Um, but it's still a bit of a challenge. There's always something to cause problems underwater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to do kind of an overview of methods for collecting cores underwater, you can insert the cores using a few different methods. Um, post hole pounder, which you can see me using in this photo. Um, a slide weight and clamp or a vibracore. Obviously, the vibracore is the fancier, more high tech option. It's also more expensive, but it is significantly faster and requires less human effort. But it's not awesome for all projects or all situations. It um, some some models of vibracores can let out a really high pitched and almost painful noise underwater. So you can't have divers in the water at the same time. Some newer models have mitigated that and it's not an issue anymore. Um, but I will say I have never had the opportunity yet to use a vibracore. I have always used the post hole pounder or the slide weight and clamp. Oh. Um, and they also have their pros and cons. Um, the postal pounder is great if you can reach the top of the core, if there isn't a huge current that's gonna be bashing you back and forth, or you have to stay at the, um, or down near the sediment, which is when you would use a slide weight and clamp. The clamp stays in place, and you are providing the percussion from the center of the core or towards the bottom. Whereas with the post hole pounder, you're from the top the whole time. Extraction is the same for all of these methods. As far as I know, um, it is always using a farmer's jack, which you can see me doing in this picture. You wrap a prussic knot around the core, loop that over a jack and with pure force and strength of will, <laughs> pull the core out of the ground. So that's the underwater bit of it. After that, it is pulled out and goes to the lab. In a pinch, you can process a core in the field, like we're doing in the top photo here. Um, but it is a little preferable to do it in a lab setting. They'll be carefully sawed open, often using a circular saw, sawn down one side, rotated, cut down the other, and using a um, fishing line or other semi-rigid rope, you want to pull the sediment part so that you have two halves. You end up with a working side that you use for sampling and an archival side for prosperity, for later recording, and for the occasional whoopsie if you drop your core. Um, 
in the lab when I'm processing and taking samples, I work from big to small and from least destructive to most destructive methods. I start off by looking at the core when it's freshly split, looking for visually identifiable strata. Um, so in this top picture, you can see there are significant color differences and I would measure and record the length of these segments and that will impact my later sampling. There are, you can use any sampling method under the sun from sampling at equal intervals down the core or I often use kind of a stratified method where I'm focusing on sampling on either side of a strata contact and then evenly within the strata. So that way, when I'm not accidentally sampling two strata at the same time, because that can really confuse your results. And especially if you're trying to date your samples, it's no good. You might get wildly different dates or wildly uh, mixed samples. So when I take those samples, I look at the texture of the sediment, the its structure, consistent color. I record what sort of inclusions are there. If I can get to looking at it with a hand lens or a microscope, I'll look at the sorting and the roundness of the grains themselves um, and record all that as some quantitative, some qualitative uh, information about those sediments. When I get into the destructive uh, techniques, which can measure percent carbonate with um, hydrochloric acid, you can take the percent of organic matter using chromosome ignition. Uh, I have used a master sizer, which is what I'm doing in this second photo, um, which gives a very exact measurement of the proportions of different grain sizes in your sample using optics, physics, it's very exciting. Uh -huh. And the samples can also be sent off for radiocarbon dating, either in bulk sediment samples or by picking out individual organic matter within strata. After all of that processing and all of the lab procedures have been finished, that is when I begin interpretation and wholesale analysis. So here I'm turning those detailed measurements into uh, a larger picture of sedimentary sequences and depositional environments. <clears throat> so I'll look at rates of deposition and the thickness of strata. I'll look at changes between high and low energy environments to describe changes in larger regional environments. In particular, in underwater, I'm looking at changes between wetting and drying and sediments deposited in aquatic or terrestrial contexts. So in this um, diagram of a barrier island, you can see one such wetting and drying event. It's this um, storm causing an overwash fan that brings ocean water and marine sediments over the dune barrier. And even after that storm surge fades away, there can be a remaining pond that may stick around for a while. It may be very ephemeral. It may go away quite quickly, but in some cases you can see that in the sedimentary record. So now that we have a kind of basis of the methods that I use for both taking the cores and analyzing them, I want to go into talking about some of those, those two projects. So the first is my master's thesis, which I'm quite attached to. Um, in this project, I looked at the relationship between two sites in the Osceola River, Spider Lily Sink, which is the blue uh, shape, 
Um, I will sometimes refer to that as WR1. It was named after I completed my thesis. So most of the figures say WR1 and but spider lily sink is the same place. Um, but so I was looking at the relationship between WR1 and brown hole, the green shape. These two sites are 140 meters apart. Um, so I was trying to answer the question of, are they environmentally related? Is there enough evidence that maybe they could be called the same site? or are they distinct? Um, I also wanted to look at the relationship of these sites to larger sedimentary sequences known from other sites in the Oscilla Basin. Um, it's in the West Run, so downriver of all that. Mm -hmm. So Brown Hole had been excavated and cored in 2021 by Dr. Jesse Halligan's FSU Field School. Um, my sediment analysis was based on excavation profiles and that core that had been taken. The general sequence is a um, marl, so a pond sediment that had been pedogenically altered. There was a distinct transition at the top of that sediment where the A and O horizons, all of those top soils have been eroded completely. And instead it is mm -hmm. capped by uh, modern river sands. So, from those sets of data at Brown Hole, I was able to build a cross section with Scuba Diver for reference um, of the general sedimentary sequence at Brown Hole, which the name Brown Hole is technically a misnomer. It is not a sinkhole, it is a shoal that is next to two sinkholes, one of which is spider lily sink. So, spiral releasing has a sedimentary sequence that is very close to that of brown hole, but it's not exactly the same. And that relationship is what interested me the most. So, because I have multiple cores here, I had an easier time correlating the U strata between them. We start off with a thick sap repel to that grades into a peat that fills the bottom of the most of most sinkholes in the Osceola River. Um, this would have represented a slightly waterlogged but very heavy organic and anoxic depositional environment. Um, so your standard peat bog. Then that strata transitions upwards into this coarse sand. We have this thick transitional layer, uh, especially in this core here where the grain size is getting larger. Um, but above that is a alluvial sand. And so in the, we remember from the previous slide, there was a thin sand lens running through um, through brown hole, this light brown layer over there. That was a really fine sand, but it fits in the same place in the sedimentary sequence as the sands at Spider Lily Sink. And that is something to keep in mind. It these sands are capped again by a layer of pedogenically altered marl. Pedogenic meaning it has soil formation. Um, except that this layer of marl is 
significantly thinner than that of brown hole and it's less altered. It spent less time exposed to air and allowed to form soil than um, brown hole did. Um, makes sense. It These cores are actively uh, deeper in the, like compared to modern water levels, but it is an interesting thing to note. So, and again, all of this is capped by modern river sands. So like Brown Hole, I was able to make another uh, cross section that we can see in this one with, once again, divers for scale. It is a much deeper sinkhole um, than Brown Hole. But like I was saying, the sediment sequence is related. This is effectively the same sediment sequence, but the grain sizes are different enough that I was able to draw the conclusion that they are not the same, but they are adjacent facies in this spring-fed erosion system. So I modeled that system here, and this is kind of the time slices of site and sediment formation in a sinkhole with variable water flow through time. So starting off in this corner, I know we're kind of gonna like zigzag across the screen, bear with me. Um, starting off in this corner, we have the initial formation of a sinkhole either through collapse or through solution. Most of the sinkholes in the Osceola River are formed from limestone dissolution. So the water over time just dissolves that calcium carbonate away until you're left with a really big hole. Um, next, we have the deposition of peat in a semi-waterlogged environment. That is our peat layer. And this that waterlogging can happen either because of increased rainfall, a generally more wet environment, or um, an increase in the water table. We move, excuse me, down to this bit of diagram, and we have spring activation. So a pressure builds beneath the sinkhole through the joints in the limestone, and eventually erodes out a conduit through which we get a spring boil. That boil will deposit coarse sands near it and fine sands out in the outskirts as the water loses energy. So at um, Brown Hole, where there was excavation done, artifacts were found in association with both the sands and the overlying marls. Um, so that is why I've included artifacts, the little red dots um, on both the first sands and later on. But so continuing on as water levels rise more and you have more deposition of coarse sands near the boil, which corresponds to what I find at uh, WR1, and fine sands away from the boil, like at Brown Hole, you continue to have We'll move on to the next one. Um, eventually, either water tables drop as sea levels go down, or a there is so much erosion within the underlying limestone that more collapses, the conduit is eventually blocked and it shoots out somewhere else. So there's a decrease in pressure enough so that some of that sand begins to fill the conduit and you no longer have an active spring in this location. There's still water there, but it's no longer a high energy environment. So silts, very fine sands and clays begin to settle out of suspension. 
if the water table continues to drop, that um, pond will keep going down and you will begin to see soil formation on that now exposed marl surface. Where there's soil is where we often find artifacts because people are there. If they were here, they're here, they're still there. So we have more artifact deposition in where there is soil formation. This final little section of the diagram is modern conditions. The water levels have risen to modern conditions and you now have differential erosion between the two sides of the channel. This side is completely eroded away. There are no more sediments and all of the artifacts have fallen down into the Thalweg, into the uh, bottom most bit of the river channel. But over on this side where there is slower moving water, you have preservation of those sediments and the artifacts in C2. So <laughs> that's kind of where I leave my thesis and we're going to move on to the second of the projects I wanna talk about today. So BAR did some pouring around Dog Island, uh, almost directly south of us here in Tallahassee. Um, well, I guess Southwest a little bit. Um, <laughs> She didn't she didn't it, but. Um, so Dog Island is a barrier island, which is kind of a unique depositional environment that is considered specific to the Holocene. Due to changing water levels and sediment inputs, all modern barrier island systems originate in the Holocene. And that's not to say that there weren't any barrier island systems in the Pleistocene or before that. It's just that they are such ephemeral uh, environments. They move so easily. They're so affected by storm activity that it is very difficult to find preserved evidence of earlier barrier islands um, prior to near modern sea levels. So they're geologically incredibly diverse. They have nearshore environments, a lagoon in the back. They have sediment input from rivers, from offshore. There are dunes, there are beaches, there are, some have springs. It's a quite complicated palimpsest of environments. As this island is moving, it becomes increasingly difficult to decipher, but that's the job I was given. <laughs> so I analyzed three cores from Dog Island. Oh, no good. <laughs> so I analyzed three cores from Dog Island last summer. They were marked on that map here. So we had one off the Gulf Coast, one in the lagoonal environment in a cove known as Ballast Cove. It has historically a lot of ballast piles. Um, and one from this natural inlet, Tyson's Harbor. So these three cores have very different sediment sequences, but they all kind of build together to tell the same story. So the Gulf Core starts off with coarse marine sand that alternates with a moosey silt. Um, this alternating high and low energy in ponded water that I interpret to be on the island in the lagoon or on land prior to sea level rise. Um, it is hard to determine which is the most likely interpretation uh, based on the current curve for sea level rise because the dating seems a little funky. We have some reversals um, and 
We're not entirely sure what that is caused by. We'll need to do it's an excuse to go out again and do more testing. Um, but after that, um, after that bit of deposition, we have a um, shallow water or beach environment in this second stratum that is overlain by the modern nearshore, slightly below average wave base marine sediments. The second core from Ballast Cove also signifies landward movement of the island. The first couple strata are from tidal and alluvial deposition in the bay or lagoon. Um, so on that more terrestrial side of the island, that inland side. Um, above that, we have evidence of shallowed water that allowed for the accumulation of a thick shell hash. So the sediment here is almost entirely made up of shells. There's very little sand. It's very coarse and quite sharp. Uh, above that, there are a continuing of coarsening sands that show increased wave action and match the core's location at the current modern wave base. So high energy, lots of turnover in sediment um, and all sand. The final core from Tyson's Harbor starts off with Aeolian beach or dune sands that is then capped by this 30 centimeters of sands on top of silts that are characteristic of an overwash fan. And that's supported by the dates we got back from that portion of the core. All 30 centimeters were deposited at approximately the same time. So that's a very significant depositional event. It's a lot of sediment to move all at once. So this location was very impacted by likely a storm um, that possibly broke open Tyson's Harbor to what it is now where, um, from being a inland or like terrestrial location to an influx of marine water allowing for a brackish environment as shown by some shells that I found in that bit and after in the top. And that top is simply, it matches the modern conditions of the area. So overall, those cores tell a story of landward movement from five to 3,000 years before present. Um, like I said, that story is not without questions. We still have more to figure out with those dating reversals um, and some possibly more sampling to really understand that large event at approximate, approximately 1,000 years ago that maybe opened Tyson's Harbor into what it is now. So to wrap things up, I just want to leave us with a few thoughts on coring. So at the scale of a single core, it's nearly impossible to assert presence or absence of a site. Um, however, a series of cores strategically placed around a site or area of interest can give context to the changes that occurred in that landscape, whether the landscape is likely to hold archeological remains um, and what areas within a site or uh, region should be given the most focus for archeological investigation. So coring emphasizes the regional context like the course taken from Dog Island or even a micro regional context, like 
I was looking at in my thesis on the oscilla. Um, and thus pouring even outside of known sites can still be inherently archeological as it can provide information on ancient landscapes where we know that people once lived. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And if we still have time, I am happy to answer any questions. I think you have to go to the bottom line after you go Wait. No, no. What do you think is the only set of the I don't think we've gotten deep enough. I don't think we've gotten deep enough to know. I don't know. Yeah. We know 15,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday I'll get back to working on it. I haven't done it well with all right, Sean. Yeah, uh, got input. Some yeah so so the the question was how old is the oldest sediment in the Osceola, effectively. And we're having some back and forth about evidence that I haven't yet read about. Uh, oops. But that's okay. an input on it being around 18, perhaps. Yes. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to put it on. Okay. Okay. Joseph Ashcraft. Started out asking, uh, unable to read sign cards on your charts. Can you explain? Okay. So the sidebars on some of the charts that I had, let me see if I can run back. We'll go with some of these. Yeah, it's a little small, but I have a scale, a picture of the core itself, the major strata breakdowns, some information about them itself. If it's a soil, I have the horizons that are preserved. Then those little green dots are the locations where I took samples within those cores. And next to that, I have the percent organic matter done by loss on ignition. Then the percent of carbonate, which is a little funky. We got some negatives in there that probably needs to be redone. Um, and finally, the colorful bit is the master sizer results. Uh, so that's grain size. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and you guys have multiple questions, so I'll turn back to the audience after this. Do you use Kirby, Morgan, or Desco full faded masters bombs? Your river charts less than one ATM. Do you use surface applied here? Okay, so for the Oscilla River projects, we were using surface applied. We were on a hookah system. At Dock Island, we were using um, OTS full face masks with comms. Uh, yeah, the depth on the deepest in the river was about 25 feet. At uh, Dog Island, it was actually shallower than that. The dip, the deepest was around 15, I think. Okay, I'm going to turn back to the audience and I'll get back to the audience. Um, were both of your facility river sites originally isolated depressions, or basically ponds? 
and then eventually they became connected by a river, and that's the point at which peak formation no longer occurred, and you started seeing river sediments deposit. So I interpreted it as being WR1 is the sink. That was the pond. And Brown Hole, while it's called a hole, not actually a hole. It, that was the shore. That was where the water was shallower. Um, and so when the spring was flowing from somewhere in the area of WR1, it would have been the shore of it would have been approximately what Brown Hole was. So at what point in dating do you think that the sinkhole was no longer isolated and it became part of the river system? A little before modern sea levels? Maybe. Uh, that's all I'm yeah. Uh, <laughs> It sounds like it, yes, there's, and with those environments, it's a lot of like one gets, like a bunch of sand gets tossed down and then it gets eroded out and then a bunch gets tossed down and it's, is kind of, yeah, like long runners of sand deposition that get moved back and forth. But this, it sounds like what you're talking about is a, it would have been a marsh and a like well, kind of sheltered deposit. Uh, current, big current water, and the bitter fish leaves on the same distance coronation. But what one of my recollection of it is that basically focused on the aging, always several days on the beach rays, uh, and that there were two sets of beach rays, uh, and that would be something in the form of twins. So they they said, but I, I guess I have to go out and see if I've done a copy of the constitution because I didn't think about it. I didn't think of it, about that at all. But every year when I'm there, I'm looking at this this pee bag washing out under yeah. several feet of sand. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple more online questions, and then uh, anything else wants to ask. Uh, Nancy White asks, what's about Island? Other barrier islands have paleoclines. Did Corey show a stable one slightly key river banks that later was browned slightly elevated, so barrier form there? I want to say yes. Um, if. Well, I, I want to. <laughs> oh. um. Yes, I do think that coring, if the location is known of the paleo points or if there's some way to target what you think could have been a riverbank, then yes, coring could show whether or not it was. Um, 
This girl can move cabinets and yes. artifact drawers too. My she secret talent. Oh, God, she and Melissa are absolute rock stars. <laughs> Nothing personal, guys. <laughs> these, guys these ladies are amazing. So, thank you for your presentation today. We would like you to accept a polo shirt, a chest polo shirt. We hope you will wear the try. You and Melissa can. Saunter around and all four of you have them now because you've all presented for past. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll have to present. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. We're going to sign up now. Thank you. Yeah.